couple small roles on the screen, Darnell Martin shifted her talents to behind the camera. She's gone on to direct a number of movies and plenty of TV shows you've probably seen, including episodes of Oz, ER, Law & Order, Law & Order Criminal Intent, and Grimm, just to name a few. Along the way in her career, Darnell has written three movies, the first being a low-budget film called I Like It Like That, which was released in 1994. Seven years after that, she wrote and directed 2001's Prison Song. Another seven years after that, Darnell wrote and directed what is to date the most recent film that she's written and helmed. With a budget of about $12 million, 2008's Cadillac Records certainly wouldn't be considered a big budget film as far as Hollywood is concerned. However, even with a smaller budget, Cadillac Records boasts some impressive talent. From Jeffrey Wright, Beyonce Knowles, and Adrian Brody to supporting roles from Cedric the Entertainer, Columbus Short, Gabrielle Union, Norman Reedus, Iman Walker, and Vincent D'Onofrio, and many, many more. Despite the name, Cadillac Records tells the tale of Chess Records, one of the preeminent blues record labels in the late 1940s and 1950s. After the film was released, critics of the movie claimed it wasn't very historically accurate. So let's dive into the rise of blues in Chicago as we compare history with Cadillac Records. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Let's take a moment to play two truths and a lie. Here's how it'll work. I'm going to share three things. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. And then we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here they are. Number one. The Beach Boys song, Surfin' USA, was ripped off of a Chuck Berry song. Number two. Muddy Waters' real name was McKinley Morganfield. Number three, Len Chess was essentially a one-man show building chess records by himself. Before we continue, I just want to say thank you to Logan Tapscott. The idea for covering Cadillac Records was a request from Logan. Now, if you want to make a request, you can shoot me an email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com and I'll add it to my growing backlog. Although, to be honest, there's currently over 200 movies in that backlog, so at a weekly show, you can start to see how far behind I am. So if you want to guarantee that your request gets covered and you can get plugged on the show, you can do that by becoming an official producer of the show over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Once again, that's patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. So thank you to Logan and with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of Cadillac Records. The movie begins with Willie Dixon, who's played by Cedric the Entertainer, introducing himself and explaining the purpose for his voiceover as being for posterity's sake, to preserve the history of chess records. Then we see those words that we're all too familiar with. The following is based on a true story. The year is 1941 when, according to the movie, a man from the Library of Congress comes out to Mississippi to record a man named McKinley Morganfield, playing his own style of folk music. This is true, but there's more to the story than what we see in the movie. Before we get to that particular moment, though, since the movie doesn't really cover his younger years, let's take a quick moment to understand who McKinley Morganfield was. McKinley was born on April 4th, 1913, on the far western side of Mississippi in Issaquina County, and I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. It's I-S-S-A-Q-U-E-N-A. -S -S That's right alongside the Mississippi River between the state of Mississippi and Louisiana. Although he was technically born in the rural countryside outside of any town, the closest town nearby is Rolling Fork. So for all intents and purposes, McKinley would refer to Rolling Fork, Mississippi as his hometown. His mother died only a couple years after he was born, so McKinley's grandmother raised him. 
As a child, McKinley liked to play in the swampy areas in and around the Mississippi River. Because most of these ended up being muddy puddles, McKinley's grandmother gave him a nickname, Muddy Waters. And that was a nickname that would stick with him his entire life. In the movie, we see a man who identifies himself as Alan Lomax, who's played by Tony Bentley in the film, along with John Work from Fisk University. Together, Alan and John pull up to Muddy's home and ask if they can record him for the Library of Congress. These are both real people, and it was Alan Lomax, along with his colleague John Work III, who would travel around the South to capture folk music. As a little side note, there's another John in the picture who was archiving the music, and that would be Alan's father, John Lomax. He started the project of capturing folklore and music in 1933 through a grant from the American Council of Learned Societies. Now, John Lomax is not in the movie at all. But his son, Alan, who was about 18 at the time, joined his father and soon grew to be just as passionate about the collection of songs as his father. John Lomax would pass away in 1948, but not before he had earned a legacy for himself, collecting thousands of songs in the U.S. and around the world. In 1941, though, the Library of Congress and Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, teamed up for a two-year field study to document the folk culture in the Mississippi Delta region. As a part of this study, Alan Lomax and John Work III teamed up. Some documentation puts Alan's father, John, along with Alan and John Work III, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were both there for each and every recording. And Muddy Waters certainly wasn't the only unknown Mississippi musician who was recorded for this project. In fact, Alan was trying to record an artist named Robert Johnson, but when he arrived in the region, Alan discovered that Robert had passed away three years prior by the locals, and so they recommended that he record Muddy Waters instead. So he did. Some others Alan recorded, including artists you've probably never heard of, like Wash Dennis, or artists that maybe you've heard their name, but you don't know much about, like Thaddeus Willingham, Turner Jr. Johnson, and Bozy Sturdeviant. Of course, no one knows much about any of those artists. Well, the father-son team of John and Alan Lomax would get a lot of credit for discovering folklore throughout the Mississippi Delta region, John Work III was just as involved. Like those other artists who you've probably never heard of who faded into history behind Muddy Waters, collecting folklore for the joint venture between Fisk University and the Library of Congress saw John Work III fading into history behind John and Alan Lomax. Back in the movie, after being introduced to Muddy Waters, who leaves Mississippi to go to Chicago, we're introduced to Len Chess as he's opening Macamba Lounge in 1947. There's a fairly major plot point in the movie that's missing here. In fact, not just a plot point, but a major person, Len's brother, Phil. Well, technically Phil is in the movie as he's played by Shiloh Fernandez, but hardly. Throughout most of the film, we mostly see Adrian Brody's version of Len Chess. The true story is that in 1928, Lejour and Fizel Shish moved to the U.S. with the rest of their family from a small village named Motal in what's Belarus today. As many families did, when they arrived in the United States, the Shish family changed their name. Lejour became Leonard, Fizel became Phil, and the family name Shish became Chess. Just so you know the spellings of these, Lejour, or Leonard, is spelled L-E-J-Z-O-R. Fizel, or Phil, is spelled F-I-S-Z-E-L. And the family name, Shish, is spelled C-Z-Y-Z. -Z. Well, the movie makes it seem like Chess Records was something that Len Chess did on his own. In truth, it was both Len and Phil working together to build the record company. Although, as the movie shows, they didn't start with a record company right away. They also didn't start with the Macamba Lounge like the movie implies. Instead, Len and Phil Chess started their entrepreneurial careers when they bought a liquor store on the south side of Chicago in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. The liquor store took off, and soon they decided to take their profits and open a nightclub. That nightclub, which was called the Macamba Lounge, quickly earned a reputation for being the place to go to listen to good music, even if it was at the risk of bumping elbows with drug dealers and prostitutes who frequented the establishment. 
this isn't mentioned in the movie at all, but as the Macamba Lounge was growing to help the Chess Brothers bankroll, in 1947, a husband-wife combo by the name of Charles and Evelyn Aaron started a small label called Aristocrat Records. Similar to what they did when they transitioned from the liquor store to the nightclub, this time the Chess Brothers were looking for another investment opportunity. Since the Macamba Lounge was earning a reputation for good music, they ended up investing in Aristocrat Records and became part owners. In the movie, we see Muddy performing at the Macamba Lounge along with a harmonica player named Little Walter. Although there's a little bit of a fight between Little Walter and some other musicians, and Adrian Brody's version of Len Chess tells them that they have to leave. That scene is all fictionalized for the film, but the truth is that even though Muddy Waters performed at the Macamba Lounge, he actually wasn't very popular there. Meanwhile, for two years, Aristocrat Records was, well, quite honestly, not very successful. Most of their records were flops, and things weren't looking very good for the company. You see, the Chess Brothers were trying to record the type of music that was flowing through their nightclub. It makes sense, but for whatever reason, that music didn't sell as well on records as it did in the club. As the story goes, when Len Chess heard Muddy play for the first time, his reaction was less than impressed. He didn't think anyone would buy Muddy's records. Remember, Muddy Waters, when he performed in their nightclub, wasn't very successful. Aristocrat co-owner Evelyn Aaron suggested that they try recording Muddy anyway, since there had been a lot of people moving from Mississippi to Chicago looking for work. She thought those folks moving north might enjoy hearing music that they were used to from the south. To offer a quick side note here, the reason for so many African Americans moving was because of something that began in 1916 that we now refer to as the Great Migration. It wasn't any single event, but the Great Migration is the term for the relocation of over 6 million families that moved from the rural south to cities in the West, Midwest, and Northern United States between the years of 1916 and 1970. While it's hard to pinpoint a single reason for the moving of millions of families, most historians agree the primary causes for the move was really a combination of harsh segregation that still lingered in the South, along with poor economic conditions for them. When World War I broke out in 1914, the U.S. needed more industrial workers. After the war, The need only continued, and many African-American families in the South took advantage of this to find work. Many of those ended up on the South side of Chicago, and some of those were the musicians who played at the Macamba Lounge. A talented few went on to be recorded for Aristocrat Records. The movie implies Muddy Waters first recorded at Chess Records, But the truth is that Muddy is one of the first recording artists at Aristocrat Records, and he was immediately successful. As a quick side note, when I say the movie doesn't mention Aristocrat Records, I mean, it's not really part of the plot. There is a very brief image for a couple of seconds where we can see an extreme close-up of Muddy Waters' first recording, I Can't Be Satisfied. At the bottom of the record, we see the words manufactured by the Aristocrat Record Corporation, Chicago, Illinois. So technically, Aristocrat Records is in there, but barely. In the movie, we see the success of that first record by way of a newspaper that flashes on screen. Quite literally, I had to pause the movie to even be able to tell what that newspaper said for the split second that it was up there. Anyway, the film cites an article from September 18th 1948 in the Chicago Defender that says Muddy's single, I Can't Be Satisfied, sold 3,000 copies. While the Chicago Defender is a real newspaper, no such article exists in the historical archives for the Chicago Defender, which you can read online, by the way. Regardless, even if the article didn't exist, the facts are true. Aristocrat Records pressed 3,000 copies of the single, I Can't Be Satisfied, and every copy sold in one day. Still, the Aarons must have thought that things were a little bit too rocky because they sold the rest of the record label to the Chess Brothers at the end of 1949. Then, on June 3, 1950, as the sole owners of Aristocrat Records, 
Len and Phil Chess officially renamed the company to Chess Records. Another artist we see in the movie is Little Walter. He is played by Columbus Short in the film. According to the film, Little Walter plays harmonica for Muddy Waters, but also records on his own. In another extremely quick flash on screen, we see the film depicting Little Walter's song called Juke, hitting the R&B bestsellers list. That little tidbit is also correct, although there's a pretty significant detail that the movie left out. It's similar to when the movie omitted the facts about Aristocrat Records. That detail is simply the fact that Little Walter's chart-topping instrumental called Juke was not released by Chess Records. Even though Little Walter played in Muddy's band, his style was different. So the Chess Brothers formed a subsidiary label they cleverly called Checker Records. So the label that released Little Walter's song Juke, as well as the song that the movie mentions later, My Babe, was not Chess Records. It was Checker Records. There's yet another singer we see in the film when Adrian Brody's version of Len Chess introduces Jeffrey Wright's Muddy Waters to a man simply known as Wolf. At least, that's what he's called in the movie. The character is billed in the film as Howlin' Wolf, and he's played by Iman Walker. And again, this is another example of the movie taking some historically accurate details and mixing them in with some fiction to tell the tale. The true story is that the man who recorded under the pseudonym Howlin' Wolf was a 300-pound farmer named Chester Burnett. Like the movie shows, Howlin' Wolf did sing the song Smokestack Lightning for Chess Records. That was in 1956. In the movie, it's that song that we see Iman Walker's version of Howlin' Wolf sing to a woman in the studio. The idea here is that even though Muddy Waters was married, he had women on the side, and Howlin' Wolf was keen on taking those women in somewhat of a competition with Muddy. All of this is, well, we don't know. Some historians say Muddy Waters was married in 1932 to a woman named Mabel Berry, who would end up leaving Muddy after he fathered a child with another woman in 1935. That would lend some credence to the possibility that Muddy was less than faithful to his wife, or wives, but we just don't know. Some historians say Muddy Waters was married at least twice. Some historians say three, including Mabel. Yet other historians say four times, including a woman named Sally Ann. During this time, most historians also agree that Muddy Waters had at least five children. Again, maybe there's more that we don't know about. Maybe not. We don't know. So, as you can probably guess, most of the personal life between Muddy and his wife that we see in Cadillac Records was made up for the film. Of the facts we do know, though, the movie has correctly named Geneva as Muddy's wife. We know that Geneva Wade was one of Muddy's wives. In the film, she's portrayed by the talented Gabrielle Union. We also know that even if Muddy had other wives before Geneva, she was the longest. Speaking of love and personal lives, in the movie we see a budding romance between Adrian Brody's version of Len Chess and Beyonce Knowles' character, Etta James. All of that is made up for the film. In fact, Len's son, Marshall, was asked about the connection between Len and Etta that we saw on screen. The interviewer asked if Len and his wife, Rivetta Chess, really made up after the love affair between Len and Etta that we saw in Cadillac Records. Marshall's response was to roll his eyes and explain that no, they didn't make up because they didn't have to. There was no affair. In a different interview, Marshall explained a little bit more. Apparently, Marshall had asked the real Etta James himself. She said that Len had kissed her once and on the cheek. As the movie continues to introduce artists, we meet yet another real character. This is Moss Def's version of Chuck Berry, whose new style of music has taken over as the hip new thing. Periodically, we see Muddy asking Len for money after this happens, implying that Muddy isn't the rich rock star that Chuck Berry is. I feel as if I should give a blanket statement that the details in the movie are really all made up. However, as we've seen with some of the other facts, the gist is there. The basic plot lines are there. The truth is that Muddy Waters never made much money off of his music. He made enough to live a comfortable life, but he was never crazy rich like many of the popular musicians are these days. 
By comparison, the real Chuck Berry passed away only a couple months ago on March 18th, 2017. When he did, he had an estimated net worth of about $19 million. Still, hardly the crazy rich that we see other musicians have these days, but certainly enough to live a good life. Oh, and for a brief moment in the film, we see Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones come to Chess Records. They say they named their band after one of Muddy's songs. That is true. The Rolling Stones were formed when Keith Richards and Mick Jagger formed a bond over their shared love of Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry Records. In their early days, they played covers of Muddy, Chuck, and the Howlin' Wolf. Their name came about when one of the band leaders, Brian Jones, was on the phone with a local newspaper. The paper asked for their band name, which the group hadn't even thought of yet, and in a hurry, Brian looked around his room when he saw a Muddy Waters record on the floor with the track Rolling Stone. And the rest, as they say, is history. Back in the movie, there's a tragic moment when Columbus Short's version of Little Walter depicts his life declining through alcohol abuse, ending in a very unnecessary fight. He manages to stumble into Gabrielle Union's version of Geneva's arms before dying. The specifics were fictionalized here, but the general idea is pretty accurate. Unfortunately, as the 1960s came around, Little Walter began to slip further and further into alcoholism. He did manage to tour in Europe with the Rolling Stones in 1964, something the movie doesn't show, but that was the beginning of the end for Little Walter's career. Thanks to what many historians believe was due to his increasing addiction to alcohol, Little Walter's talent just wasn't what it once was. We don't know the specifics of exactly what happened, but we know that he was involved in a street fight in 1968. Like the movie shows, it was this street fight that would take his life as he succumbed to the head injuries that he suffered during the fight. Little Walter was only 37 years old when he passed. When the movie comes to an end, we see Len Chess selling off Chess Records. As he does, he drives away from the building and has a heart attack, dying in his car just feet away from the studio. That is not true. The Chess Brothers did sell Chess Records to another record company called General Recorded Tape, or GRT, for about $6.5 million, as well as around 20,000 shares of GRT stock. Sadly, just a couple months later, Len passed away. Even though Phil was still alive, the loss of Len was a massive blow to the record company. Whether it was because of the new owners at GRT calling the shots, the passing of one of the driving forces behind Chess Records in Len Chess, or some combination of those two things, there was a significant decline in the quality of music being created at Chess Records after Len's death. Within six years of Len's passing, Chess Records was nearly defunct, and GRT was disassembling its assets and personnel. In August of 1975, these struggles were passed on to the parent company, GRT, and now they were going under as well, and they sold off what they could of Chess Records to another company called All Platinum Records. After this, the Chess Records building in Chicago was sold, and the new owners demolished the building, including about a quarter of a million records that were still inside. While the movie doesn't mention this at all, since it doesn't really include Phil much, it was just a few months ago, on October 18th, 2016, when Phil Chess passed away. As the movie comes to a close, we see a list of talented individuals from Chess Records who are now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's a total of seven listed in the film. Willie Dixon, Howlin' Wolf, Etta James, Chuck Berry, Little Walter, Leonard Chess, and of course, Muddy Waters. All of that is true. It's also true that Phil Chess, at least of, as of this recording, has not been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, while his brother, Len, was. Maybe that's why the filmmakers decided to focus more on Len than Phil. Anyway, today, if you buy music from any of the great musicians who recorded on Chess Records, They'll be available through the Music Corporation of America, or MCA, as they hold the masters to the back catalog from Chess Records. At the very end, 
The movie uses text on the screen to explain what happened to the real people that the characters in the film were based upon. And while those characters weren't entirely realistic in the movie, the text at the end is actually also a little bit iffy on its historical accuracy. Like the movie says, Muddy Waters passed away in 1983. April 30th, 1983, to be precise. And like the movie correctly states in that text, that's 10 years after Geneva died. She passed away from cancer on March 15th, 1973. While we don't know if Muddy was entirely faithful to Geneva throughout his lifetime, they are laying beside each other for the rest of time. I'll put a link to a photo of their tombstones laying side by side with each other in the show notes if you want to see them. As for Howlin' Wolf, he passed away on January 10th, 1976. The movie claims that blues legend Eric Clapton paid for his tombstone. That's something that some historians agree with and yet others debate. Some say it was Howlin' Wolf's widow who paid for it. So there is some debate about that. It's not a fact. There's not a lot of documentation that we have about it, and it's not something that Eric Clapton has come out to clarify. If he did do it, he did it in private and to honor the legend of Chester Arthur Burnett, Howlin' Wolf's real name. He was an artist that Eric Clapton had the honor of recording with early in his own blues career. Even if Eric Clapton didn't pay for the tombstone, one thing that we know about the wolf was that even though he made a decent sum of money throughout his career, he didn't live lavishly. Instead, he was modest and chose to pay his band well. According to the movie, Etta James won a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2002 and is still performing throughout the world. That is not true. Etta James did win a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, but according to the Grammy's official website, it was in 2003, not 2002. So while I realize the awards are often given for the year before, this was a Lifetime Achievement Award and it was given to Etta in 2003. And while it was accurate when the movie was released, the last part of that, Etta performing throughout the world, sadly not true anymore. She died on January 20th, 2012, just five days before her 73rd birthday. After this, the text on the screen in the movie says that Chuck Berry was successful in suing the Beach Boys for their song, Surfin' USA, claiming it ripped off of Chuck Berry's song, Sweet Little Sixteen. That is very true. In a recent interview, the Beach Boys singer, Brian Wilson, admitted, quote, I just took Sweet Little Sixteen and rewrote it into something of our own, end quote. As a result of the lawsuit, Chuck Berry got writing credit and royalties. Oh, and something the movie doesn't mention is that Chuck Berry's publisher also sued the Beatles for ripping off of one of Chuck's songs, You Can't Catch Me, in the Beatles tune, Come Together. John Lennon agreed to settle out of court for that one. That's not the last lawsuit, though. The final bit of text on screen in Cadillac Records says that Willie Dixon sued Led Zeppelin for ripping off one of his songs. As a quick little side note here, the movie has a typo. They spelled his name Willie, W-I-L-L-E, instead of Willie, W-I-L-L-I-E. But that bit about Led Zeppelin plagiarizing one of Willie Dixon's songs is true. The song from Led Zeppelin was Whole Lot of Love, which was released in 1969. Seven years earlier, Willie Dixon had written the lyrics to a song that Muddy Waters sang called You Need Love. For copyright reasons, of course, I can't include those here, but if you check out those lyrics to the two songs side by side, you'll see they're quite similar. Close enough that Dixon won the case, and the Led Zeppelin song now has to have Willie Dixon included in the credits for writing the song. Despite this, according to Willie's daughter, Shirley, he never saw much monetary gain. According to Shirley, quote, There was no significant money to Willie from record sales. He went to his grave feeling that he was not represented properly. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. To learn more about the history of chess records, I'd recommend the book Spinning Blues into Gold, 
The Chess Brothers and the Legendary Chess Records by Nadine Cojodas. Or to learn more about McKinley Morganfield, check out Can't Be Satisfied, The Life and Times of Muddy Waters by Robert Gordon. And of course, go hop onto YouTube and do a search for Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Etta James, Little Walter, Chuck Berry, and all of the amazingly talented musicians who inspired many of today's musicians. Check out their music and maybe even go pick up some of their albums. While many of the artists aren't alive themselves anymore, their families are. I'll make sure to put a link to those books and much more in the show notes over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the two truths and a lie game, let's share another five-star review from iTunes. This one comes from username KA underscore Excalibur, who says, quote, I love movies, and movies based on true stories are definitely in my wheelhouse. Dan's show is very well produced and informative. I love hearing some of the often crazier stories that inspired some of my favorite movies. Catch Me If You Can is ridiculous. I also love that the show is a perfect length for my 20 to 30 minute commute, so I can squeeze a couple of episodes in every day. Great work, Dan. Keep it up. End quote. Thanks so much, K.A. Excalibur. I know this is a little bit off topic, but I'm a huge King Arthur fan. In fact, not many people know this, but one of the very first websites that I ever built just for fun was called CamelotOnline.net, and the entire thing was just a bunch of stories that I wrote about King Arthur and his knights. Anyway, that was over 15 years ago, and so long ago that I used frames to build the site because that was the thing to do. Eek, I know. I probably use tables too, but I can't remember, and the Internet Archive won't pull up the site for me because, well, no modern browsers use frames. If you're a web designer or developer, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, sidetrack there. Thank you so much for the kind review, K.A. Excalibur. There are some crazy stories, aren't there? I love being able to tell those stories, and it means the world to me that you're enjoying the show as much as I'm enjoying making it. And thank you, dear listener, for taking the time to find and listen to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you want to leave a five-star review for me to read in a future episode, hop over to iTunes. Oh, I'm sorry, Apple Podcasts. Finally, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the Beach Boys song Surfing USA was ripped off of a Chuck Berry song. Number two, Muddy Waters' real name was McKinley Morganfield. Number three, Len Chess was essentially a one-man show building chess records by himself. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number three. While the movie makes it seem like Len Chess was the primary guy behind the business end of chess records, he had a brother named Phil who was just as involved. And now I have a question for you. Yes, you. Who is your favorite blues artist? Is it one of the musicians that we've talked about on this show? Or is it someone else? Or maybe you're not into blues. Who is your favorite musician and who were their inspirations? The next time you're on Facebook, why not join the Based on a True Story podcast Facebook group and post your favorite blues artist or your favorite musician? You can find the group by searching for the Based on a True Story podcast on Facebook, or if you're not on Facebook, you can find the show on Instagram, where it's at Based on a True Story podcast. Or you can find me directly on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or maybe you're not a fan of social media at all. You can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at Based on a True Story podcast dot com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.